Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a video about sharing data. In this video, I'll show you how to share folders and make them available to users across the network. Then I'll show you how to set up something called disk quotas, which is where you can control the quantity of data that users are allowed to store on your servers. Then I'll show you how to make files available to your mobile users through the use of something called offline files. And then I'll give you an overview of the Distributed File System, or DFS. First we'll start off by simply learning how to share folders. Now the first thing I'm going to show you is how to share a folder using Windows Explorer. This is essentially the way that we have done it for many, many years through many different operating systems. The interface is slightly different in Server 2008, so I'll show you those changes. But then I'll go ahead and show you how to install the file service server role, which is something that is brand new to server 2008 and does give you some additional capabilities, one of which is the use of something called the Provision A Shared Folder Wizard, which is a, a neat tool that allows you to not only share a folder, but allows you to set up all aspects of that share. And then finally, we'll go ahead and talk about how to access shared data on a network. All right, let's go ahead and take a look. OK, for this demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and connect back with New York member one. This is the member server that in the last video we already began setting up as a file server. So let's connect to that now. And the first thing I want to show you is that without installing any additional roles, you can share folders by default within the Windows Server 2008 operating system. So let's go ahead and click on Start. Select Computer to take us into Windows Explorer. Go into our C drive. And let's create a folder to be shared. So I'm going to right click, select New Folder. And we'll just call this folder Shared Data. And then let's go inside that folder and create some data. So I'll right click, New. And this time we'll go to text document, and we'll just call this shared text. OK, so we've got a folder with some data in it, and it's ready to be shared. Now the easiest way to share a folder in Windows Server 2008 is to simply right click on the folder and select share. This takes you into a nice, simple interface to where by default it has here that the administrator, who I'm logged in at, will be the owner of this share. Now these different permission levels, this is where the interface has changed slightly from previous operating systems. In the past, the permissions have been known as full control, change, and read. Whereas now we have owner, which is the user who is creating the share initially. Owner is the equivalent of full control. We have co-owner, which is what you would assign to additional users and groups and also has full control. We have contributor, which is the equivalent of the old change permission, which allows this particular user or group to read and write. So you can not only read or access the data, but you can make changes to it. And then you have the reader permission level, which is the same as the old read permission, which allows just that. It's read only. It allows you to only access the data, but you cannot make any changes. So by default, we have the administrator already in there as the owner, because that's who I'm logged in as. And if I wanted to go ahead and add an additional user, I could just put the name in, or I could go ahead and find somebody. You'll notice it defaults to everyone. This is very common, where you just give everyone access to a share. But if you want to add a specific person, you can select Find. And then we created that Ed Lieberman account. So I'll put in Ed, check names. There I am. Click OK. And now Ed Lieberman has been added as a reader. And if I wanted to give this account more access, I could just click on the arrow here and select from the list the level of access I want to give to this account. Once you have the list of people that you want to actually share this information with, all you have to do is click on Share. And you'll see there the folder has now been shared. Now there was nothing else I really needed to set up other than that. And by default, it has given it a share name equal to the actual name of the folder. It's been given the shared data name. Now if I right click and select share again, you'll notice that this time, since it's already shared, 
I have the choice to either change permissions or stop sharing. So I'm going to select stop sharing and it says you have stopped sharing the selected folder. I'm going to click on done and the folder is no longer shared. That's the super easy way to share folders in Server 2008. Now if you want to go back to something that is similar to other previous operating systems, then what you would do is right click on the folder and go to properties and then click on the sharing tab. On the sharing tab you have this share button which essentially will work exactly the same. Let me click on this here. You'll see it takes you to the exact same place we just had before. I'm going to cancel out of there because what I want to show you is this advanced sharing. Advanced sharing is much closer to the way we used to do it in the past. This is how I can check a box saying yes I want to share the folder. Then I can give it a share name. Now if you have a folder that you want to give a name different than the actual name of the folder. So on your network you may have folders that have lengthy names and you want users to be able to access it with a very simple name. You know, maybe shared data is too long and you want them just to be able to access it with the name data. Something as simple as that. You could put that in as the shared name. And then from there, you can go down here and click on permissions. When you click on permissions, you'll see again it defaulted to everyone with read. That is what has been the standard since Windows Server 2003 and what it was semi pushing with the other interface although you, you'll notice the other interface didn't have it on there by default it just pushed it when you go to add somebody but if you wanted to go ahead and change permissions you could do so through the old interface where you add users this way and then you check the boxes for full control change and read it really doesn't matter how you set this up there are always multiple ways to do things so let me go ahead and click OK and close and you'll notice just like before I didn't point this out before but there's an extra little icon that gets added to the folder to represent that it has been shared but this is how you share folders using Windows Explorer if you don't want to add any additional roles to your server now speaking of roles there is a role that we can add to the server which gives us even additional capabilities beyond this when it comes to shared folders. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this folder. I'm going to go ahead and add the file services role and then show you how to share this folder using the provision a shared folder wizard. So I'm going to right click, share, tell it to stop sharing this folder and done. Okay, now I've pretty much undone everything that we've done other than still having a folder out there to be shared. So I'm going to go ahead and close Explorer, click Start, and go into the Server Manager. Once in the Server Manager, I'm going to click on Roles and select Add Roles. Now the role that we want to add here would be the File Services role. Now when we add this role, you're going to see in just a moment, there's a number of different things we can do here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. It gives you a quick overview. Next. Okay, here is where you can add additional file server services. One being the distributed file system, which I will go ahead and check the box because we're going to get into that just a little bit later here in the video. I'm going to select the file server resource manager and I'm going to do that because this has to do with disk quotas which we're also going to get to in just a little bit later in the video and I'm not going to select any of the rest of these services for network file system has to do with and you'll notice that's a proper name network file system or NFS which has to do with coordinating with other operating environments the Windows search service which has to do with searching and indexing which we're not going to worry about for right now and then backward compatibility to old Windows Server 2003 file services so I'm going to leave this set up just like this where we're going to go ahead and do DFS and the file server resource manager I'll click next because I selected DFS it's asking me if I want to create a DFS namespace I'm going to select the button that says create it later using the DFS management snap-in when we talk about DFS but it's good to know that you could do it right here right now it's going to also ask me about storage usage monitoring and this is because we selected 
the file server resource manager service. It's asking us if we want to do storage usage monitoring. I'm going to go ahead and check the box just to show you briefly what this does, but otherwise we're not going to worry about this for right now. I'm going to click on my C drive, the only drive that we have, and you'll see here that what you can do is it says this is an 80 gig capacity on this particular drive and then you have a usage threshold so this is kinda keeping tabs on exactly how much data is available this is actually not a bad idea uh, to have running on your file servers what this is basically saying is if you were to get to 85 percent of usage you've now crossed through a threshold where you might be getting into a danger level and then it will create some reports to show you why you might be at those level. Now I can click on options and we can get into much more detail about we can first of all control what that usage threshold is at what level I want to be notified and I can also control what types of reports I want to see. Now if I choose to have a report then the next screen is going to go ahead and ask me well, where do you want to store these reports and or do you want to get these reports via email, et cetera, et cetera. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck this, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to uncheck the box, because we're not going to look at this monitoring right now. Now when I click Next, it's not going to ask me about the reports, because I just said I don't want to have a report. So here it's just giving me a confirmation of installing the file services role. The services in particular are going to be the file server service, DFS namespace service, DFS replication service, and file server resource manager. So I'm going to click install. It'll take just a few moments for these services to install. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. If you're following along, please do so as well. And I'll resume as soon as it's done installing. OK, the file services installation has succeeded. So I'm going to go ahead and click close to close this wizard. And you will see here that we now have the file services role installed. And as a matter of fact, if I expand roles, and expand file services. Take just a moment here. All right, you'll see here that it shows the share and storage management utility. And then inside of there, you'll see that we have our file server resource manager and disk management utilities. So there's a number of different utilities that it has added in along with this role. So let's go ahead and close out of the server manager. And what I'd like to show you now is how to share this folder using this provision a shared folder wizard so what I'm gonna do is click on start go to administrative tools and we're gonna go ahead and select that share and storage management utility once in the share and storage management utility I'm gonna go ahead and put my cursor give it just a moment here while the hourglass goes away it's pretty much scanning the system right now okay I'm gonna go ahead and right click on the share and storage management local icon right here and I'm gonna select provision share now this is something uh, that is pretty cool if you are going to be in a large environment and have a lot of advanced needs but is quite frankly somewhat of a nuisance to do it this way if you're in a smaller environment where you have very simplistic needs okay so I'm gonna take you through the wizard and as we're going through you'll see that there are certain aspects of this wizard that you may not understand yet and you might find it interesting to come back to this point in the video and to go through this again after we've completed the entire video and have explained things like disk quotas and offline storage and DFS so the first thing we have here is the shared folder location. So we need to find the location of a folder we want to share. So I'm going to click on Browse, go into our C drive, and we're going to go to our shared data folder and select OK. Which, by the way, before I click OK, you'll notice that I can click Make a New Folder. So if need be, if the folder didn't exist yet, I could have created a folder and shared it at the same time. But I'm going to go ahead and click OK since we do have a folder available and then click on next now it gives me the opportunity to decide if my NTFS permissions which we talked about in the last video if these permissions have already been set up appropriately or if we need to make a change so if they've already been set up appropriately then just simply leave it at no do not change permissions if you do need to change the permissions 
click yes and edit permissions and then you have the opportunity to do so. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out and say no and TFS permissions are okay. I'm going to click on next. Now it takes us into share protocols and really this only has to do with if you are coordinating with Unix clients using NFS, that network file system, the service that we did not install here. If we were using it, then we could select NFS and give it a share name specifically for the Unix clients. Since we are only working with Windows right now, we're only going to select SMB, which by the way stands for server message blocks. You don't you don't have to know that, but just in case you were wondering. And the share name, this is where I have an opportunity to give it a specific share name. I'm going to go ahead and leave shared data. I think that's a very appropriate name for the folder. It's an appropriate name for the share. And then here it tells you what the shared path is going to be, which is double backslash the name of the server that we're on, backslash the name of the share. This is what's known as a UNC, Universal Naming Convention. That's the name of the share path. I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. Here we now get to our SMB settings, and this is getting more advanced than, than where I want to take you right now. But what we could do is we can set a user limit. If you want to limit the number of users that are uh, allowed to connect to this folder simultaneously, you can do that here. Matter of fact, let me click on advanced, and you'll see here maximum allowed, meaning we have no limit. This really is something that it's been around since forever. And in the old days, we used to have to do this because servers didn't have the capabilities of handling too many users. Now, with today's hardware and with today's networks, this is usually not an issue. Now, down here, we can enable access-based enumeration, which again, I mean, just to read this to you, it, it filters the shared folders visible to a user based upon their access rights. And this really has to do with if they don't have access to it, don't let them see it. Okay, so again, an advanced feature that we're not going to worry about for right now, but kind of a cool thing to, to know about when you get to that level. And then we have caching, which has to do with offline files, which we'll talk about later on in this video. So let me cancel out of here, and we'll, we're just going to go ahead and click next beyond this screen because the user limit has been set to maximum. Good. We're not going to worry about enumeration or offline files. Matter of fact, you'll notice here offline settings, it says selected files and programs available offline. So they are by default available. And we'll talk about that when we get to that section of this video. I'm going to go ahead and click on next. Now we get to our permissions. We can either select all users and groups have read only. Now that's the default. Everyone has read. You could say administrators have full control and everyone else has read. You can say that administrators have full control and everybody else has read and write, which is the equivalent of change. Or you can just go down to custom permissions and click on permissions and set it up manually. The choice is up to you. I'm going to go ahead and take the default, which is all users and groups have read access. I'm going to click next. Here's where you can set up a quota policy. Now I will tell you that quotas have to do with controlling how much data users can store through this share. Now beyond that, I'm going to go ahead and pretty much skip the screen because we're going to talk about quotas in just a moment and you'll understand at that point. But for right now, if you wanted to do it, you just apply the quota and then you go ahead and use the template to assign that quota. I'm going to not do that for right now. We'll come back to that when we talk about quotas. Click on Next. This is a nifty little thing. The file screen policy. This is where you can now apply a file screen which allows you to control what data is stored on the share. If you want to protect your share from potentially dangerous data, or in this case it says block audio and video files, that's not necessarily as much dangerous as much as it is large in quantity. Audio and video files are quite large, and you may not want those large files stored. Maybe this share was designed for simple uh, Word and spreadsheet documents and things of that nature. So if you wanted to, you could apply a file screen. You'll notice here it also says to create or edit the screen template. You could use the file service resource manager, which we will take a look at in just a moment when we get to quotas. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uncheck the box and not apply a file screen, but that's a neat thing that you can do. Click Next. 
Here we have DFS namespace publishing. And again, when we talk about DFS, you'll see how this all comes into play. But basically, if we had a DFS share created, which we do not, we could publish this share into that DFS share. Again, it'll probably make more sense to you after we finish this entire video. I'll click Next. You get a review screen saying, here's what you're about to do. And I'm going to click Create. And here you get a confirmation that the share has been created. I'm going to click Close. I'm going to go ahead and close out of here. And I'm going to actually go back into Windows Explorer just to show you. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and hit F5 on my keyboard to refresh this window. I know it might seem kind of weird. I just opened the window. But believe it or not, it does need to be refreshed sometimes. And what I just refreshed was showing that that icon uh, represents that this folder has indeed been shared. And actually, going through that big long wizard the way I just did it, I didn't do anything different than when I originally right clicked and selected share. Okay, I did the exact same thing, but I wanted to show you that wizard so that you could see all the additional capabilities you could put in place simultaneously as opposed to in the past we used to have to share it first and then we would go set up our quotas, set up our offline files, set up DFS. It all had to be set up separately, whereas now we can do it with one simple wizard. OK, so now that we have shared a folder, we now need to try to access that shared folder. So let me go ahead and minimize our member server for just a moment. And let's go ahead and connect with a client. Here we have New York Vista 1, Vista Client. We'll use that to connect. All right, now that we're connected to New York Vista 1, one of the ways that we can connect to this share would be by clicking Start. And in Vista, you no longer have to select Run. The older operating systems, you'd click Start and then select Run. Now we have this Start Search window where you can just put in the UNC, which is double backslash server name, which is New York Mem 1 2K8 backslash, and then the name of the share, Shared data. Now you may have noticed while I was typing that it was already populating things up here in the search window. That's a new feature in Vista where you start typing it and it starts searching immediately and if it finds it it'll make suggestions to you. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, put that in and hit enter. And then as long as I am logged in with somebody who has the credentials to access this folder it should open up. Now I'm presently logged in to New York Vista 1 as the administrator. And sure enough, there we go. It connected to that share. And we know that this is the right folder because here is our shared text file that we put into that folder. So that worked. Now, another way that we could do this, and this is very common in many networks, let me go ahead and close this window, would be to do what's called map a network drive. So I'm going to click on Start. And there's many different ways you can do this. I'm just going to go ahead and right click on computer. And I'm going to select map network drive. And when I do this, I need to give it a drive letter. What, what we're doing here is we're assigning a drive letter on our client machine, which is going to represent that shared folder. So we could go ahead and just select any old letter. So let's go ahead, uh, let's do S, right? The S drive, because it's a shared folder. I don't know. You can do whatever drive makes sense in your environment. And then for the folder itself, put in the double backslash New York Mem 1 2K8 backslash shared data. I can choose whether I want to reconnect automatically at logon. That means every time this user logs in, do you want to create this mapped drive? I'm going to uncheck that box, but typically you'd have it checked. If you're going to go ahead and map a drive, typically you want that drive to always be there. Now I can also connect using a different name. If I was logged in as a user who does not have access to this share, I could go ahead and say, all right, although this particular user doesn't have access, I'm going to go ahead and connect using a specific username and password that does have credentials. We don't need to do that right now, so I'll cancel out of that. But we have everything we need in place, so I'm going to click Finish. And now, not only does it show us the window, but let me go ahead and close this. I'm going to click Start Computer. You'll notice that not only do I have my C drive, but I also down here have an S drive, which is the shared data share out on that server. So I can access it readily at any given time. All right, so 
that is pretty much how you share a folder and access that share. Now let's go talk about disk quotas. Disk quotas is a feature of the Windows operating system that has been around since Windows 2000, which allows administrators to control the quantity of data that users are allowed to store on the servers. Now, this is something that in the, in the old days before Windows 2000 was a big problem because user, you'd have one shared folder on one drive that you've set up for let's say a hundred users, but you'd have that one user who's storing some mega data and tying up all the space, leaving the other 99 users with next to nothing. So disk quotas gives us control over that. Now what I'm gonna show you here is how to set up disk quotas using Windows Explorer, which is the original way of doing it, and really the interface hasn't changed at all since the inception of disk quotas. I'll show you how you can implement these quotas through group policy, and then also, now a brand new way of setting up disk quotas, which is with the Quota Management Council, which will be available to us because we installed the File Server Resource Manager when we installed the File Server role. So let's go take a look at how to set up disk quotas. Okay, so here we are back on our New York member server. And I want to first show you the old way to set up disk quotas through Windows Explorer. Now, one thing I want to make sure that you understand is that disk quotas cannot be set on a share by share basis. In other words, here I have a shared folder. I can't control specifically how much data is stored in that share. What I can control is how much data is stored on the volume that the share is on. So since this share is on our C drive, I can control it through the C drive. And the way you can see that is if I were to right click on this folder and go to properties, you won't see anything about disk quotas here. Even if I click on sharing or even advanced sharing, there's nothing about disk quotas here at all. I'm going to cancel out of here. If I right click on the drive itself, and I will tell you it has to be an NTFS formatted partition for this to take place. I'm going to go ahead and click on properties and here you'll see there is a quota tab. Select the quota tab and what I can do is go ahead and enable quota management if I want to control how much data users can store on this drive. So I'm going to enable quota management and then once it's been enabled, well then I have to configure it. Now the first step in configuring it is there's a checkbox here asking whether I want to deny disk space to users exceeding the quota limit. I know you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, why would you enable quota management but not deny disk space? Well the reason why is because you may want to have quota management in place which keeps an eye on how much space users are using and maybe even send out warning messages when they get to a certain level your users may be doing mission critical things that you don't want to have them truly locked out of a drive just because they've stored too much data. So this is something you need to take into consideration. Do I want to truly block somebody who exceeds their limit or just give them a message letting them know that they've exceeded their limit? The next thing we need to decide is what is the default quota limit for any new users on this volume? Now it says new users so the first time anybody stores something on the volume they will be subject to this default quota limit. Also, right now, any users who have already stored data on this volume, well, they will be considered a new user right when we enable quotas. So this is kind of like the default startup limit and then also for any additional new users. So we can either not limit usage. Again, you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, why enable quota management, not deny disk space, not set up a limit on disk usage. Well, that's because this is the default quota limit. You can set individual limits, which I'll show you in just a moment. But for the default, let's go ahead and say that we want to limit disk space to, and, and you know, it could really be any amount. It really has to do with how much space you have, how many users are going to be accessing that space, etc., etc. So just to set a number, let's go ahead and say that we're going to limit disk space to 100. Now, we don't want to do kilobytes, that would run out awfully quickly. We're going to say 100 megabytes. And then we're going to set a warning level, and we'll say, how about at 90 
megabytes. Now what this means is a user will be limited to 100 megabytes. As a matter of fact, I'm going to check the box saying that they will truly be denied. It means that a user can store no more than 100 megabytes on this drive and they will be warned if they exceed 90 megabytes. That way they don't just suddenly run out, they get a little warning first. Now down here, we can also choose to log events in the event logs when users either hit their warning level and or exceed their quota limit. Now that's kind of it. That's the basics to setting up disk quotas. Now down here, we have a button that says quota entries. That will take us to another window where we can set up individual entries. So I could select quota, new quota entry, and I can select a user, so I will use the Ed Lieberman account again. Click OK. And this particular user, maybe this user needs more than 100 megabytes, or maybe this user, for whatever reason, you want to actually make it more strict and give less usage. But I'm going to go ahead and say that maybe the Ed Lieberman account needs one gig. We'll say that Ed needs a lot more than 100 megabytes for what he's doing on our network. So we'll say one gigabyte, and we'll set the warning level at, let's say, 950 megabytes when he's getting close. Now click OK, and you'll see here, let me, let me expand some of these. You'll notice that this is the built-in administrator's entry, which is there by default, and you'll notice that they have no limit. And that's very important, not just because they're administrators and you want to say, hey, I'm an administrator, I don't have a limit, but many of the operating system dependent things will rely on files in which the administrator is the owner. And that's how quotas are determined, by the way, by whoever is the owner of the file. So you don't want the administrators to have a limit because that could interfere with the operation of the operating system. So that setting is there by default. But then here we have the Ed Lieberman account, presently has used none because I, I would need to log in and actually store some data. But my limit has been set to a gig with a warning level of 950 megabytes. And again, percent used zero because amount used is zero. That is the old fashioned way of setting up disk quotas. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. And go ahead and click apply, make sure that's all turned off. Close out of this window. Because the next thing I want to show you is how you can set up disk quotas using group policy, which might be better for your environment because you can control more than one computer at a time. Whereas here, I'd have to go to each and every computer. You'd have to go to each and every drive, each and every volume, and set up these disk quotas manually. Now, in order to do this through group policy, we need to go to a domain controller. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize our member server for a moment here, and go ahead and connect to New York DC1 one of our domain controllers. Once connected to New York DC1, we need to go look at a group policy. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Start, Administrative Tools, and here we have Group Policy Management. Because we're not trying to learn group policy here, I just want to show you some of the settings. I'm going to go ahead and go into editing the default domain policy. The whole concept of group policies and how to manage them would be discussed in our Active Directory course. And by all means, if this ends up being too confusing, go ahead and watch the Active Directory courses on group policy and come back to this point if necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and right click on the default domain policy and select Edit. And here I can see the Group Policy Management Editor, where I can see the configuration for both computer and users. And I will tell you that disk quota management is done through the computer configuration. So under computer configuration, I'm going to go to Policies. I'll expand that. And then it's under Administrative Templates. I'll expand that. Under System, I will expand that. And here we have Disk Quotas. I'll highlight that. And over here, you'll see there are some settings. Now, let me scroll over a little bit just so you can see they're not configured. Matter of fact, if I click on standard, there you go, they're not configured. But if I wanted to configure them, all I have to do is double click on the setting. And this one is just, do I want to enable disk quotas? Well, if I want to, enable it. Okay, simple as that. 
The next one would be to enforce disk quota limit. Again, I could choose to enable that. Now that's if I want to actually enforce it, meaning do I want to put the true restriction? Do I want to deny them access if they exceed the limit? You'll notice I keep canceling and go back to not configured because we're not going to do this right now. Now instead of closing out and going to the next one, I can actually click next setting and it will take me to the next setting on the list. You can watch the highlight bar back here. You'll see it going down the list. Now here is where you can set the actual limits and warning levels. If you enable this policy, I can now go ahead and put in the quota limit and then click on next. Log event if it's been exceeded. Log if the warning level has been exceeded. And this is where I can choose. This is one that's um, not necessarily used so heavily, but you could choose whether you want to apply the policy to removable media or just built in volumes. In other words, do you want it just on your hard drives or do you want to actually put these limits on maybe some USB drives, removable media? Now, let me explain real quick what we're doing here. Obviously, you can see, oh, looks, looks like I enabled one and left it enabled. So let me get out of there and apply. Okay. These settings are very similar to what we just saw through Windows Explorer. The difference is by doing this through group policy, you can have these settings apply to all volumes on a whole selection of computers. Now in this case, because it's the default domain policy, it would be all computers in the domain. But group policies can also be assigned to specific groups of computers and that's where this could come in real handy where you may have let's say all your file servers set up as a specific group that you're gonna apply this group policy to and then by default all your file servers will have these quota limits so that's another way that you can control disk quotas for your users so let's go ahead and close out of here uh, let's close all the way out and I will actually completely disconnect from our domain controller and we'll go back to our member server so that we can take a look at the last way of controlling quota management and that's by going through the quota management utility in the file service resource manager now we access that by clicking start administrative tools and here's our file server resource manager in here is where you can control quota management file screening and storage reports. Now you might remember that we chose to not do storage reports right now, so there's nothing really to do there. As far as file screening management, we saw that when we were going through the provision a shared folder wizard. So this is where we could, if I click on file screen management, this is where we could go ahead and create file screen templates. But for right now we're talking about quotas. So under quota management, you'll see here that we have quota templates and there are some built-in templates that already are in place and already gives control to a certain level. These are some common levels that Microsoft has seen over the years, so they gave you these templates to begin with. If you want to create your own template, what you would then do is right-click in the open area and say Create Quota Template. From there, it says copy properties from which template. So basically, if you want, you could start off with one of these templates. So we'll start with this 100 megabyte limit template and click copy. And then it'll go ahead and start you off with those settings. If you don't want to copy from an original template, that's fine. You can create your own from scratch. But here we could give it a template name and we could say sample quota template. And then down here, we can give a limit. So maybe this limit will be 200 megabytes. Now, hard quota versus soft quota has to do with whether you want to allow them to exceed the limit or not allow them to exceed the limit and only use it for monitoring purposes. Okay, so again, this is all going to be exactly the same as what we saw in Windows Explorer, but now we're setting it up as a template so that we can take this template and apply it in different places. So here we have a limit, whether it's hard or soft, and then down here we have notifications where we can go ahead and set up warnings. And you'll notice here that these warnings, you can set multiple warnings, and here at 85% they're going to go ahead and email the user, at 95% email and put an entry in the event log, 
and then 100% again send out an email and put it in the event log. So if I wanted to add my own warning, I click on add, set the percentage that I want this warning to be at, choose whether I want to send an email to the administrator and or send an email to the user, choose whether I want to make an event log entry, we can choose to run a command. There may be some kind of cleanup script that you have that, that does some kind of maybe auto archiving. So maybe when you get to a certain threshold, you run a command. And or you could go ahead and generate a report based upon exceeding a threshold, just as we saw back when we first installed the File Server Resource Manager service. Okay, so that's all the stuff that you can do with this. Let me go ahead and close out of here. And I actually won't even keep this sample quota template. I, I don't need it right now for anything. But what I do want to show you is up here where it says quotas. This is where you can go ahead and right click and say create a quota. And here you give it a quota path. So I'm going to go ahead and select to browse. And here I'll go ahead and set the path to the C drive. Create quota on path, derive properties from a certain template, so I can actually in here just simply use a template, or I could even go ahead and create a custom quota entry right here without a template. So the templates are not required, they just come in very handy if you know that there's going to be the same types of settings that you're going to use in multiple locations. So this is another way that we can go ahead and set up quotas. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it on the C drive, create the path, and click Create. Now it wants to know, do you want to save this as a template? And I'm going to say no. Go ahead and save the quota, but don't create a template. Why? Because I used an existing template already as it was. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And now here we have a quota that has been created on our C drive. All right, so that's pretty much how you set up disk quotas and control the quantity of data that users can store on different volumes. So now let's go talk about offline files. Offline files makes it possible for mobile clients to work with a cached copy of files from a shared folder while disconnected from the network and then synchronize back with the server, back with that shared folder, when they are connected to the network. And Offline Files works almost transparently to the user. Now I say almost transparently because you do occasionally see the synchronization taking place, but it's transparent in the sense that the user doesn't have to do anything specific to make this happen. There are settings that you can control as far as turning on or off the ability to use Offline Files on the client. But typically, once it's on and once it's working, a user, when connected to the network, will access the share, no problem. And when the user is away from the network, so we'll say uh, a mobile user, and we're not talking about somebody who's necessarily on a mobile phone, but even just a laptop, but somebody who's mobile away from the office, when they want to access that same data, they would go ahead and connect to the share, or they would think they're connecting to the share, just the same way they do when they're in the office, but instead of connecting, they hit the cached copy stored on their local hard drive, they can make changes to that cached copy, and then when they get back to the network, automatically it synchronizes back to the server, and it even knows how to deal with conflicts. So let me go ahead and show you how Offline Files works. Okay, so here we are back on our New York member server, and I don't know if you noticed this before, but let me let me take you back to a screen we've been at before. I'm going to right click on the shared data and go to properties and go to the sharing tab and then click on advanced sharing. I don't know if you noticed this before, but there's a caching button. And if you click on that caching button, here you can see that this is where you can set up your offline settings. Now, the default is this button right here that says only the files and programs that users specify will be available offline. This is what was previously known as manual caching. What that means is we are allowing caching of documents from this share, but users will have to manually ask for it. They don't get it automatically. Now, if you wanted the users to get it automatically, 
then you would go ahead and check this button that says all files and programs that the user touches really it says that users open from the share will be automatically available offline and then the opposite would be this one down here files and programs from the share will not be available offline that's if you have maybe data that's of a secure nature and you don't want to have cached copies out on other machines so these are the choices that you have and the default is typically acceptable you just simply share the folder and without doing anything else manual caching has been enabled on that server so let me go ahead and get out of here and now that we know that caching is available on this shared data folder then let's go ahead and go over to our Vista client and access that information and I'll show you on the client side how you work with offline files so let me go ahead and minimize my member server go back to our Vista client now the first thing I want to show you in the Vista client is the offline files control panel so let's click on start and control panel and by the way I have this on classic view so if yours looks like this it's gonna be a little bit different I like to use the classic view makes it nice and easy for me just to go right down here to offline files I'm going to double click on that and here you'll see that offline files is enabled by default if I did not want to allow this client to be able to use offline files I would disable it I will tell you by the way that that will require a reboot so we're not going to do that right now so let me go ahead and uh, get out of here and what we need to do is connect to that share so that we can make a file available offline so I'm gonna click on start and then in my start search window I'm gonna hit double backslash New York matter of fact I don't even have to type anything because we've connected before so it's right here go ahead and click on that link and that will take us to the share once we have the share here I have a document within the share in order to manually select it I right click and select always available offline so I'll select that now and here it's preparing files so that they're always available offline you'll see there's a separate little it's actually a sync or an offline files icon uh, depending on which way you want to refer to it as it's the same icon and you'll notice down here there's an icon and this I'm gonna right click is for the sync setter which we'll look at in just a moment but this document is now available offline and here you'll see that you can even select to work offline and or you can ask it to go ahead and sync right now these are a couple of new features within Vista now that this has been set up to be available offline I'm gonna come down here I'm gonna right click and I could choose to either sync all my documents I could stop syncing but I'm gonna to go to open the sync center in the sync center you'll see here that we are set up to synchronize our offline files this is a newer version of the synchronization than what we had in the past and it gives us a lot more flexibility if I were to right click on this and go to schedule for offline files you will see here that we could go ahead and we can set up a schedule for when we want to synchronize this particular share click next we can say at a schedule time where you set a specific date and time or you can set it up for an event or action and the examples are like every time you log on or connect to a certain network what you also can do is I'll right click is right here I can ask it to go ahead and sync so there's a lot of different ways to do it you can do it that way you can click sync all if I highlight this I can sync that way <laughs> they kind of give you a multitude of ways of doing this but quite frankly you don't have to do any of it that's the cool part we can just get out of this sync center it's done here it is it will sync if we want to stop using it offline then all we have to do is go ahead and right click and clear the checkbox don't always make it available offline and now it says it's changing to make it not available offline the icon goes away and there you go it's not available offline anymore now you'll notice once you make one file available offline that the sync and the work offline buttons will still exist and down here you'll still have your sync center because if I go into my sync center you'll see that this sync partnership still exists even though I have no offline files selected the concept of offline files has been enabled on this machine and it's gonna pretty much stay that way unless I disable offline files 
So that's pretty much how offline files works. Now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about DFS. DFS, which stands for the Distributed File System, is something that is used typically in your larger organizations. And the reason why is because in these organizations it can be very difficult for users to remember where stuff is because there are so many shares available and there's just data all over the place. The other thing that happens in your larger organizations is you tend to find that you'll have the same data in more than one location. You didn't want it that way, but it'll happen. And I'm talking about without DFS. You'll end up with users in one location storing data on a server in that location while users in another location will store data in a share in that location. And that creates a problem because then that data is potentially out of sync. So DFS is going to give you a single namespace in which users can use to access all shares on the network and they don't ever even have to know exactly what server the specific shares are on. They just connect through the single link. Now also DFS allows for redundancy and this is where I was just mentioning uh, in, in a typical environment you'll end up with data in multiple locations but you didn't want it to be well now you can intentionally have the same data in multiple locations but now have it as a replica have it synchronizing with one another and then users not only do you have multiple copies for you know we'll say high availability fault tolerance redundancy but users will be connected to the closest available server that has a copy of the data which means now you have much more efficient access to the data as well now I'm gonna kinda show you a quick example of setting up a DFS share but we do have this covered in more detail in our Intro to Windows Server 2008 video, which is a free video available online. So feel free to, to go browse through that video as well to get more information about DFS. Okay, so here we are back on our New York member server. Yeah, let me go ahead and close Explorer. We don't need that anymore. And what we need to do to set up DFS is go into the DFS management utility. So we do that by clicking Start. Administrative Tools, DFS Management. In the DFS Management Utility, you'll see there's a selection here for namespaces. And the first step to setting up DFS is to create a namespace. So I am going to right click on namespaces and select New Namespace. Now I need to pick a server that's going to host this new namespace. And I want this server to be the server that we're on, New York Member 1. I'm going to do it easy by browsing and just putting New York mem1 check names that way you know you've got the right spelling and click OK I'm gonna click next and it gives you a warning that this server does not have the DFS service running now we did install the role back when we installed the file services role but the service doesn't run until you set up a namespace so it's asking me if I want to start the service and I'm gonna select yes now I need to give a share name for this namespace and I'm just gonna call it shared stuff okay the shared stuff namespace and I can go into edit settings where it'll show you what server what the name of the shared folder is gonna be where on the hard drive you're gonna store this on the local hard drive you can change this if you like I'm gonna leave it to the default but you can put it anywhere you like if you have a designated spot on your hard drive where you want to store it that's fine I am going to change the permissions down here though. This is where you set up your shared folder permissions just like you would any other share. I'm going to put it down to this one that says administrators have full access and everyone else has read and write because we're going to want to make some changes after we get this set up. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK and then click Next. Now I need to choose whether this is going to be a domain based namespace or a standalone namespace. If I make it a standalone namespace, that means that the share will be directly on this server itself. Whereas typically in a domain environment, which we're in here, you would do a domain based so that the share is based off of the domain name, not the server name. Now this checkbox right here, enable Windows Server 2008 mode, can only be used if A, you're using all Windows Server 2008 computers, and B, your domain enforced functional levels have also been set to Server 2008. 
The advantage of doing so is that now you will have increased scalability and access-based enumeration, as it has listed right here. Remember, the access-based enumeration, we saw that before, has to do with users only being able to see what they have access to. But in this case, I'm going to have to clear the checkbox because I happen to know that my domain and forest functional levels have not been raised to server 2008. And if you know that yours has been done, you can leave it checked. Otherwise, clear the checkbox as well. In just a few minutes, I will show you exactly where those functional levels are set. So I'm going to clear that box and go ahead and click Next. And you see we get a review screen, and I'm going to click Create. It goes through, and it attempts to, well, first of all, it install, it started the service, and now it created the namespace, and both were a success. So I'm going to go ahead and click Close, and we have completed the first step. If I expand this here, you'll see, to creating the globalmantics.com shared stuff namespace. But the namespace is essentially worthless unless you have stuff in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a shared folder to this namespace. And you do that by right clicking on the namespace and selecting new folder. Here I'm going to give the folder a name. Now it could be the name of the original folder that you're connecting to or just like with any other shared folder it can have a, a, a a unique name that users might find more appropriate to understanding what's in that share. So I'm going to actually name it just data because that's not the name of the original folder. If you remember, the original name of the folder was shared data. So I give it a name of data and then it wants a, a target. So I'm going to click on add and I'll put in double backslash New York mem1 2k8 backslash Remember before it was called shared data. That was the original share. So I'll click OK. Now that target is there. I click OK once again. And we now have the data share as part of this DFS namespace. Now let me go ahead and minimize this for just a moment. Because what I want to do is click Start. And then in the Start search window, we want to go ahead and connect to the DFS share. So I'm going to put in double backslash globomantics.com because that's the name of the domain backslash shared stuff and hit enter and it takes me into a share and in that share is a folder called data and you'll notice if I click on data it takes me into that shared stuff folder that we had created earlier and we know that because here's the shared text document that we had created. Now you might be thinking, you know, for a user to have to go ahead and click start double backslash globalmantics.com shared stuff might be a bit of a nuisance, but you can take it a step further. Let me close this. And you could go ahead and map a network drive for the user which will go ahead and connect to the globalmantics.com shared stuff share for them. And you can have it even reconnect it, log in and everything. So you can make it so that every time the user goes to explore, right, goes to their computer, they see that, that new map drive with that DFS share. And when they go in there, they see a folder called data, and that's got the data that they're looking for. That's all they need to know. They will never need to know exactly what server this share resides on. The next thing that I want to do is go ahead and create a replica on another server. So what we're going to do is go back to DFS management and on our namespace I can right click and select add namespace server. In the namespace server what I want to do is I want to add New York DC1. Okay, So we're going to make that server the replica. And the reason I'm going to pick on that one is because we have to go over there anyway so that I can show you how to set the domain and forest functional levels. Now again I can edit the settings and give the permissions that I want on that particular share. And although you'll see here it is creating a separate share, the users will never know about this. This is a replica that is being created for behind the scenes. So I'm going to click OK. And when I do, it's going to go through and create this replica. And once that replica has been created, what will happen is the same data will exist in both places. Now this will take just another moment and there you go. It's been created. 
All right, to show that it's been created, I'm going to click on Namespace Servers. And you'll see here that now you have a share on both New York Member 1 and DC1 for this one particular namespace. And what that means is both computers now have the data. And to show you this, let me go ahead and close DFS Management. Let me actually close this and I'll go back to it again. Let me open up my computer. And you know, instead of going to the share, I'm going to go to the local disk. And on the local disk, I'm going to go to DFS Roots because it's in there that we said that we were creating the share. There's shared stuff. And inside shared stuff, and there's the data. Now, if I were to go ahead and go out of New York Member 1, go back over to New York DC 1, and on here, go into the computer, go into the C drive, go to DFS Roots, there's the shared stuff. And if I go into shared stuff, there's the data. See? It works just that simple. So that is how you set up DFS. As long as we're on DC1, let me show you where to set up the domain and forest functional levels, in case you're not familiar with that. What you need to do is click Start, Administrative Tools, and go into Active Directory Domains and Trusts. Once you're in this utility, you can right-click on the globalmantics.com domain, and you can raise the domain functional level. And the domain functional level right now is Windows 2000 native, and that means that we support domain controllers going all the way back to Windows 2000. I could upgrade that to Server 2003, meaning that we support back to Server 2003, or I could raise it all the way up to Windows Server 2008, which means we have exclusively Windows Server 2008 domain controllers. Now, the network that I have here, although we may not touch all the different machines in this video, I do have prior operating systems, so I'm not going to change my functional level. But if you want to do yours, if you only have Windows Server 2008, that's perfectly fine. So I'm going to hit Cancel. But it's in the same utility that if you right-click on Active Directory Domains and Trusts, that you can raise the forest functional level as well. Now this can only be done after you've raised all your domain functional levels. And you have the same choice. It's currently Windows 2000. You can raise it to 2003 or to 2008. And by the way, the reason I'm not raising it, just to show you, is because once you've raised it, you can't go back down. And so until I know that all my servers have been upgraded, I can't do that. So anyway, that's how you raise the domain and forest functional levels. So let's go see what we've covered in this video. All right, well, after watching this video, you should now know how to make folders available for users to access across the network by sharing them. You should be able to control that access through shared folder permissions. You should also be able to control the amount of data that users can share by configuring disk quotas. You should know how to make files available to your mobile users through offline files. And know basically how to set up DFS. Well, that's pretty much it for this video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one.